Chapter 10 The Birth of Jesus as Illustrating the General Law of Conception and the Vital Relation of Man to God The eloquent Balmes has well said, The mysterious hand which governs the universe seems to hold in reserve for every great crisis of society an extraordinary man. This truth finds a complete illustration in the birth and life of Jesus the Christ. An infant in the arms of its mother, in a cradle or in a manger, is one of the most beautiful objects in nature, and no doubt a very divine thing. I hope to make this appear in what I shall have to say in the brief compass of this chapter. An infant is the divine flower that is to ripen into the mature fruit of manhood, but it is not suggestive of absolute but only of derived divinity. With regard to the infant Jesus, if we free ourselves from the enchantment that distance lends to the view, and from the influence of all dogmatic theories which are the creation of subsequent ages, and see him as he lay in the manger of the caravansary of Bethlehem, we might be moved at the sight, but it would be difficult to conceive of him as a god. There is something divine in all infancy, and no man ever looked into the face of a newborn babe without a certain feeling of respect and veneration amounting almost to worship. Hence the divinity most adored in the Roman Catholic Church is an infant. Maternity is the divinest function of human nature. The worship of Mary by millions of people is a blind instinctive recognition of this truth. It is only secondary to the divine operation that goes by the name of creation, and a genuine motherhood stands next to the Godhead. And what shall I say of the product of this proximity? Only that there is a point in our lives where God and man, divinity and humanity, most intimately meet and blend into one, and that is infancy and childhood. There is an eternal meaning in the words of the prophet, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Father of Ages, the Prince of Peace. In every child we behold a divinely human power, born of woman, but conceived by the Spirit of God, and a multiplication in an individual form, and under finite limitations, of the divine life. In adult age, in order to get into the closest proximity to God in union with Him, we must return to the divine innocence of childhood. For unless we be converted and become as little children, we cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. As Wordsworth has expressively said, heaven lies around us in our infancy, or, as another has said, the child who lays on its mother's breast is nearest to the portals of heaven. The sexual instinct is not an unholy and depraved action of the human mind, but is a finite image of the irrepressible conatus of the divine mind to create, a divine impulse to add something to the sum total of happy existence. Creation is a necessity of the infinite love. God can no more help creating, or begetting, as the word means, than he can avoid living. His being must have existence, or an outward manifestation. And the same loving omnipotence to which we owe the commencement of our being will, if we consent, renew, and restore our natures impaired and damaged by sin and disease. Whatever we may think or believe of the human nature of Jesus, one thing is certain, God was never born or begotten. We're born of God, and so was Jesus the Christ. The name the child of Mary received was familiar to Jewish ears, being the Greek form of the Hebrew Joshua, by which he was known among the Jews. It was a common name among that people and by it they perpetuated the fame of their great warrior in the same way as we do honor to the memory of Washington by giving his name to our children. He was, undoubtedly, a remarkable child, who can readily believe this, and endowed with active spiritual instincts, but he grew in wisdom as well as in stature, and from infancy to manhood he seems to have undergone a perfectly human development. His intellectual and spiritual precocity exhibited at the age of twelve shone all the brighter for the dark background of Jewish stupidity on which the picture appears. But all the phenomena of his childhood, and of his manhood's brief career, will appear plain and natural if we can form a true idea of his conception and the influences of the circumstances under which it took place. It matters little who the father of Jesus was, since in the divine paternity we have the origin of all human life. With regard to Jesus there is but a slender basis of fact on which to erect a theory. The church dogma of his conception involves the monstrous, I had almost said the blasphemous, absurdity of the infinite God begetting himself in the womb of a virgin. Who the father of Jesus was is a question I have no disposition to discuss, much less to enter into any controversy about it, since all human life finds its origin and paternity in God. In the highest sense, none of us have any father but God, the one life of the universe. In the profound oration of Paul L. on Mars Hill, he quotes with approval the line from the poet Aratus that we are all God's offspring. Our individual existence is a sprout from a divine underground root and always connected with it. From the meager array of facts which anyone can give, 
it might be allowable to indulge in some guesses at truth, since absolute knowledge with regard to it is out of our reach. The current Orthodox doctrine is one it is difficult to accept, as it places the birth of Jesus so far out of the ordinary course of nature as to be inconceivable, and, consequently, cannot be made an article of faith. Most thinking people within the pale of orthodoxy feel that the less said about it the better, while those outside are disposed to look upon it as they do upon the Greek myth of the birth of a full-grown Minerva from the brain of Jupiter. There may be a substratum of truth in both, and in the case of Jesus we shall try to find it. If we examine the more extended account of Luke, for Mark and John are both silent respecting it, all that can rationally be made out of it is that he was begotten under a high degree of spiritual influence and divine afflatus, which gave character to his whole life. It is a well-established principle in the physiology of generation that the circumstances and influences under which conception takes place give a permanent shaping to the character of the new being. I choose to interpret Matthew by the more rational view of the physician Luke. Perhaps we have in this passage the true theory of all conception. As all individual life is a derivation from God, the vivifying of the ovarian germ may always be ultimately referred to the operation of the Holy Spirit or the emanating sphere of the divine life. If it be accomplished through an intervening medium and agency, it is still the same. K. I move a rock from its place with my hands alone, or by the instrumentality of a lever turn it over, I am still the cause and origin of the movement. If this theory of conception is true, and the cohabitation of the sexes is only the occasion and not the cause of the impartation of soul life to a pre-existing germ, it takes the generation and birth of Jesus out of the class of miraculous events, and brings them into the compass of the uniform laws of nature, or the undeviating mode of the divine procedure. It seems to me that to impart the soul principle to an ovarian germ, so as to constitute it a distinct and living individual, demands a divine power as much as the creation of a world. If it be true, as Paul L. affirms, that in God will live and have our being, it must be equally predicable of the commencement of our existence. The beginning of spiritual life in the germ cell must he from a divine Promethean spark. Then we are all, in a proper sense, sons of God, and begotten of the Holy Spirit, and, having one Father, we are all brethren. In the birth of Jesus we have an illustration of the general law of conception and generation. There may be much of truth in the saying of Emerson that the history of Jesus is the history of every man written large. His life shows what everyone was made to he, and what undeveloped possibilities there are in human nature. This does not make him any less, for he remains still all that he ever claimed for himself, but it gives a divine dignity to the whole of humanity. He claimed to be the Son of God, and called God his Father, but he taught us to address the divine being as our Father, who is in the heavens. The universal fatherhood of God all de consequently the universal brotherhood of men, is an idea that he introduced into the world. In the Sermon on the Mount all those who are peacemakers as well as those who do good for evil are called sons of God. In the Gospel of Luke all who do good, especially to the unthankful and the evil, are called by the Christ the sons of the Most High. The belief that Jesus had only a one-sided earthly parentage, that of the Virgin Mary, rests on a slender foundation. It is based on the evidence of a dream, a kind of proof. That would have no weight in a civil court, and would not weigh as much as a feather in the scale in settling any doubtful question in theology or philosophy in the present age. It has the disadvantage of not being our own dream, but that of another man more than 18 centuries ago. And it only affirms that the conception of Mary was from the Holy Spirit, which may, as we have seen, be perhaps predicable of the origin of all men. Mary asserts that Joseph was the father of Jesus, thy father, and I have sought thee sorrowing. In the genealogy of Jesus, in the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew, he is traced back through Joseph to Abraham. Why is this? What is that to do with it if Joseph was not his father in the ordinary acceptation of that term? In the third chapter of the Gospel of Luke, the line of succession runs back through Joseph to Adam, who was called the Son of God, and it is said that Joseph was I.D.'s supposed father. This is a feeble translation of the original term, which rather signifies that such was the current and unquestioned belief. It was taken for granted, and never doubted, that such was the fact. If this was a mistake, Jesus never corrected it. In the common speech of the day, he was called the son of Joseph. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? Philip findeth Nathanael, and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law, and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth the son of Joseph. John I. 45. The simple fact, 
unadorned by any theological fables, seems to be this. A young woman named Mary had been espoused at the age of sixteen, as the church legends say, to a man much older than herself, by the name of Joseph, whose business it was, as Justin Martyr records, to make yokes and plows. In those days, as every Jewish scholar knows, espousal was in fact a marriage. It gave to the man all the rights of a husband. The low recognized it as a legal wedlock, and separation could be effected only by a writing of divorcement. Though no fruit of this virtual marriage was looked for, yet she was found in the incipient stage of a not undesired maternity, and Jesus was their first child. This is as likely to be true as any theory that we can construct, and is perfectly consistent with the idea he so often expresses that God was his father. He was at the same time the son of man and the son of God. I have no disposition to pursue the discussion of the subject further, and the sacredness of the subject restrains me from employing the reductio ad absurdum, which would be a most effective, logical weapon to be used against the current theological belief. To one who loves Jesus, it is more important to know that he still is, and what ho is than to understand how ho came into existence he represents the highest type of manhood, and, consequently, the highest manifestation of the Godhead. The Grecian gods, as Jupiter and Apollo, were all men. But Jesus the Christ is far more human than any of them, and, consequently, more divine. A vital, sympathetic union with him cannot but elevate us to a more exalted plane of spiritual existence, whoever was his father, or even if he had no known earthly parentage. The nearer we get to him by a moral likeness, and the more we'll assimilate the divine life that was, and still is, in him, and which is even now communicable to us through his personality, the closer is our proximity to the deity. Happy is the man who realizes the conscious fulfillment of his promise. Lo, I am with you always, and, if I go away, I will come to you. His presence is to be sought and found not in the Eucharistic elements, but in our own spiritual nature. As Ho was never mentally or physically diseased, a sympathetic conjunction with him must bring to us a healthful and renewing influence. Nothing but a sanative influx, a spiritually therapeutic emanation can go forth from him. Let us remember that a sincere invocation of aid from him unites the severed link between our being and his, and puts his life and God in vital communication with ours. Jesus the Christ is the highest incarnation of the Logos, or the Word, as an inward light, and, consequently, union with him places us in a receptive relation to the divine life and light. Benaventure speaks of the Word as incarnated in the personality of Jesus as an interior light to mankind. Ho is the interior teacher and one can know no truth except by this word, which speaks, not vocally as would do, but by an interior illumination. He is himself in our souls, and diffuses the light of true, and living ideas over all the abstract and dark ideas of our intellect. In the preface to the Gospel of John, the Logos, or Word, is said to be the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world, and as many as receive it, to them it gives the power, or, as it is rendered in the margin, the right, the privilege of becoming the sons of God. In closing the discussion of this subject, the question arises, when viewed from this standpoint, that of a real, but exalted, humanity, can Jesus be to the diseased and sinful what we all need, a Savior? I unhesitatingly answer, yes, far more so than when we view him from the position in which the creeds of the church generally place him. Untold myriads of souls have found in him all that his name implies. He is a divine manifestation in the flesh, a human being intensely conscious of the identity of his life with God's life, and through him and in him we may have access to the illuminating and vivifying word. What more can any human soul need? The pure and lofty mind of Jesus, his deep and living spirituality, his irrepressible love for humanity, of which he was a part, his desire to make known God, and to impart to all the divine life and light that were in him, is what lifted up those who intimately knew him to a higher stage of existence. And the same inspiring and elevating influence can be received by all who come into a vital sympathy with him in his true humanity today. He may become to us the highest mental and spiritual guide to health and happiness. The man Christ Jesus, in his glorified humanity, is a mediator. He bridges the chasm which our ignorance and sensualism have opened between the human soul and God, and in him and through him the finite spirit may meet and mingle with the infinite life. A genuine faith, a faith that is a divine conviction of God and the things of God, is one of the greatest moral forces in the universe. It summons into activity all there is of life and power in man, and develops all that is good in German human nature. Faith in Jesus, not as a theological myth, a mere theoretical and unsubstantial, divine apparition, but as a personal, human, 
living, and ascended but still present Christ places the soul through the overflowing fullness of his spiritual being in communication with the unfathomed depths of the one life. According to Paul L., Jesus is exalted above all principalities and powers, and every name that is named, not only in this ago, but in that which is to come. This was the untroubled, all-satisfying faith of the apostles and primitive believers. Of the incomprehensible metaphysical puzzle and contradictory jargon of the Athanasian Creed, they were blissfully ignorant. To them the Christ stood at the summit of all created existences, below the absolute and the infinite, but above all that is finite, as the upper link in the chain of being, where it fastens to the uncreated mind and conjoins all below to him. Yet he was, and is, a man, the man Christ Jesus. As such he still lays down his life for men, that is, consecrates his blissful existence to the good of all. And we are saved or healed, through him not so much by his death as by the sphere of his life. When on earth, in his fleshly manifestation, those who came to him he directed to the one life. He is today more accessible to the souls of men than when his presence was limited and restrained by a material body. If as a human personality he was ever a savior to the bodies and spirits of men, he can be more to us now. The self-styled and pseudo-evangelical view of Jesus takes him so far out of the sphere of human sympathy and removes him so far from us that he becomes inaccessible and unapproachable by the souls of men. There is an almost impassable gulf between us and him. If it had been the studied design of the church to exclude men from the saving influence of Jesus, I know of no way in which this could have better been accomplished in harmony with the laws of mind than by the method adopted. They took away the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and neither entered in themselves nor suffered those who would enter in. The dark and bloody history of the church has been the result of this. For many ages they took away from the faith of men the humanity of the loving Jesus, and the result was an inhuman religion, a relentless and persecuting bigotry. In Tur language the word humanity is used for kindness, benevolence, and, especially, a disposition to relieve. Persons in distress and suffering. It is a fact to be accounted for by some spiritual law that in proportion to the extent in which the idea of the true humanity of Jesus has been banished from Christianity, it became an inhuman bigotry. So far as the humanity of Jesus retired into the background in the creed, a cruel, implacable, and merciless spirit came to the front in the life of the church. It is thus today, and always will be. But the true idea of Jesus is gradually but surely being rescued from the theological falsities beneath which it has been buried but not suffocated, and men will find him again as a true, but exalted, humanity. And in all the inner virtue of his name Jesus, that is, Savior or Healer, we must accustom ourselves to make a distinction between Jesus, the name of his person, and the Christ, which is a designation of a state and character which he attained at an age long subsequent to his birth. Jesus was not born the Christ any more than Abraham Lincoln was born President of the United States. Owing to the spiritual influences and conditions under which he was conceived, the soul of the child Jesus was, by an antenatal predisposition, open to the reception of the living word or illuminating spirit. And he seems to have been educated from within and not from without. Ely's mind, as a tabula rasa or clean slate, was not preoccupied by the study of Jewish literature, and he affirms that his doctrine was not his own or self-originated, but received by influx from the Father. His spiritual nature, by the vivifying influence into it of the life and light of the Word, was fully developed instead of remaining, as in most men, in a dormant, chrysalis state. Thus, he gradually became the Christ, the Anointed, or Knowing One, just as Gautama, who was born of the Virgin Maya, is said to have become a Buddha, or, as the Sanskrit word means, one who knows. Something analogous to this has often been exhibited in the history of the world and especially in the development of Emanuel Swedenborg into seership. He became one who knows far more than Gautama. In the case of Jesus, there was witnessed a perfectly normal evolution, or unfolding, of the deific soul germ, or, as Swedenborg calls it, the divine internal that is in all human souls. I look upon Jesus the Christ as the highest illustration in the history of mankind of a fully and harmoniously developed humanity. In such a being there must of necessity be such a blending of the divine and the purely human that it is difficult to tell where the boundary is that separates the one from the other. The individual man becomes so mixed with God that it is next to impossible to disentangle them. But this is no miracle, but only a higher order of nature. I believe as much in the divinity of the Christ as the most so-called evangelical and zealous orthodoxy ever did, but only in a different way. The way in which the child Jesus was developed into the Christ is the law of the highest education, or unfoldment, 
of the innermost nature of man. There is an infinite meaning in the saying of Jesus to his disciples, as the pioneer of a higher and diviner development of man, I go to prepare a place or attainable state and spiritual position for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again in the influx of the sphere of my life and receive you unto myself or elevate you to the spiritual position I occupy, that where I am, there ye may be also. In this he teaches that his state is not unattainable by others, and that he is willing to share it with others. This makes the exalted man Christ Jesus more of a savior, restorer, and redeemer than the church creeds have ever done. In this we see an illustration of the principle laid down by the Christ and engraved, as it were, over the entrance gate of a genuine Christianity, in which the sounding line of the church has been too short to fathom, that the true disciple is to be a copy of the master or teacher, the disciple, the scholar, the master to suffering, to active usefulness, and to the glorification of his humanity, and by a spiritual likeness becomes a repetition of him, and an echo of him. If any soul of man needs more a Savior in Jesus than this view of him gives, he will search far and long through all the creeds of Christendom before he can find him. If this is a heresy, may it rapidly spread over the entire globe until, by beholding Jesus as he is, all may be changed into the same image from glory to glory by the Lord as a spirit, which is the marginal and literal rendering. Through a sympathetic union with him, an affectionate melting of our souls into his, a fusion of our life with his life, and a blending of our mode of thought and feeling with his, may the world advance to the realization of a higher incarnation of God in the whole of humanity. This will be the fulfillment of the words of the Christ. If I be lifted up or exalted from the earth, I will draw all men unto me.